Richard Bosworth, thank you so much for joining me on the Real Clear Values podcast. That's a pleasure, Tom. Richard, it's fair to say that you have been researching and teaching in relation to Mussolini and Mussolini's Italy for several decades now. How many, how many books is it that you've written on the subject? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I, um, I've written lots of stuff about um, Italy since uh, the end of the 19th century, really. I mean, about 30 books that I've written or edited. Wow, quite a few then. So so let's let's dive straight into it then. Let's dive into Mussolini's fascist movement, because this is something that the word fascist is mentioned quite a lot in contemporary times. And, and you and I have spoken about this and perhaps the meaninglessness of the word. So let's talk about what fascism meant in Mussolini's Italy. What what did it look like in Italy and, and how would you define it? Well, those are very grand questions. Um, should we start perhaps a little more slowly to um, talk about what Italy was like? So I um, mean, yeah. the actual date of the foundation of fascist movement was the 23rd of March, 1919, when a body called the Fasci di Combattimento was set up with Mussolini as the leading figure in Milan. Um, Mussolini was a journalist. He had a newspaper, um, which um, was his a personal newspaper that he'd um, been operating since uh, November 1914. Um, before that, he'd been editor of the Socialist Party's newspaper, but he'd broken with the socialists over the question as to whether or not Italy should enter the First World War. Italy was nine months late in entering the First World War. It would later be nine months late in entering the Second World War also. Anyway, Mussolini then acquired a newspaper called Il Popolo d'Italia. The newspaper was partially financed by rich Italian industrialists and partially by the French Secret Service. Later on, the British Secret Service also put funds into the, into the newspaper on the grounds that it was favouring Italian participation in the First World War on, um, it, on the same side as Britain and France. So that's Mussolini's background. He was um, <clears throat> a pretty skilled journalist. He had done very well in terms of increasing the circulation of Avanti when he was editor of that from 1912 to 1914. And his newspaper, although small, perhaps had some influence in the, um, in the noisy debates in Italy um, while Italy was, uh, while the Italian politicians were getting around to entering the First World War in May 1915. So, um, as I said, nine months late. Um, in, in 1919, Italy had ended the war. Um, you know, in 19, of course, in November 1918, the, the fighting finished, in Italy's case, a week before it did on the Western Front. So the, Italian, um, the Italians always celebrated the 4th of November, not the 11th of November called it Vittorio Veneto Day because that was a town in, um, in, the, in, the, in the area of the Veneto, north of Venice, where the Italian army had um, finally defeated the Austro-Hungarian army in 1918. However, Italy had had an uneasy war, um, tremendous casualties, um, perhaps 750,000 or so. Um, in, in, we'll see later when we talk perhaps about fascism dictatorship in the Second World War, that actually that number is 50% um, higher than the number of Italians who die in the Second World War. The Italians had entered the First World War aggressively in the sense that no one had invaded them in May 1915. They simply decided to go to war with Austria-Hungary as their allegedly traditional enemy. They'd been allied with Austria, in fact, before 1914. And um, the war hadn't brought Italy as many gains as its political leaders um, had talked about it getting, um, there was a huge, I mean, the, the, the word that comes up all the time is Romanita. If anyone's been to Rome, they'll know what the Victor Emmanuel monument looks like in Piazza Venezia in central Rome. This huge monument that had been planned after the death of King Victor Emmanuel II in 1878, and it sits right beneath the capital of classical Rome beside the Forum. And is plainly saying, also then in liberal times, that this is the third Italy, an Italy which also will have a great empire. In 1919, Italy did not have a great empire. It had some, a couple of um, poor colonies in, in the Horn of Africa um, with um, 
um, very few Italian settlers there, um, Eritrea and Somalia. And it, in 1911, it had seized, 1911, 1912, it had seized Libya from the Ottoman Turks. But by 1918, its troops with some difficulty controlled some of the coastal towns and nothing much more than that. So for some of those reasons and for the sense that the Italians hadn't been treated as a great power should have been treated by the Allies, by Britain and France especially, um, the, uh, the nationalist poet, and according to him, the world's greatest lover, Gabriele D'Annunzio invented the phrase a mutilated victory on Vittoria Mutilata to sum up the um, problems that Italy was facing in 1919. And so Mussolini's foundation of the Fasci di Combattimento is very much from that exact period of an Italian perplexity about what their claims to be a great power meant. And also because there were some social problems in the country, perhaps we can talk about them in a moment. Okay, so there's all sorts going on in Italy, and that's really what lays the groundwork for fascism to come into play. So, what do, what does what does Mussolini do in creating this or shaping this ideology of fascism, and how does he become the leader of the movement? Movement Il Duce, meaning the leader, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. He'd been called the Duce, and quite often before. Um, 19, uh, 1919, he um, perhaps was a rather dominating personality. Mind you, the word had been used about other, uh, other Italian um, politicians in that time. And um, also the word fascio meant almost nothing in 1919. It wasn't at all clear what it had meant. It had been used over and over again in Italian by Italian political groups, some on the left, anarchist socialists, a group of doctors who happened to belong to the Italian parliament called themselves the Fascio Medico. And back in the 1890s, there'd been a sort of revolutionary, anyway, very discontented socialist-ish movement in Sicily who called themselves the Fascio dei Lavoratori, the, the, the Fascio of workers. So the, the word is quite common, Fascio di Combattimento simply means a group of uh, people who've come back from the war. Combattimento means those people who've been fighting in the war. And so all, all you have in 1919 is a small group of people rather like Mussolini, people who think of themselves as intellectuals of some kind, as journalists, um, and are certainly not at this stage with any mass following at all. Now, here we do come to two other really important things that, or three perhaps that have to be said about Italy. Italy, from the time it became a, a nation state in, the, in 1860 through to 1922, was called liberal Italy. And that word has caused a lot of confusion, I think, really. What it did mean was that Italy had a parliamentary system under a monarchy, under a monarch, from in, in the case of uh, the 20th century, from 1900 to 1945. That monarch was Vittorio Emanuele III, and he remained the monarch of the country and so the, the constitutional head of state right through the fascist dictatorship as well as for a generation before that. But the parliament was not the liberal parliament, was not a place of modern political parties of the thought that the British think of because they can all sing W.S. Gilbert's tune about, W.S. Gilbert's words about Sullivan's tune about how every boy and every gal who's born into the world alive is either a little liberal or else a conservative. In Italy, it wasn't like that. The parliament was made up of factional groupings who um, were around a leader, perhaps might be called the Duce or something, but anyway, some sort of leader who normally had access to a newspaper, um, which he might own or which um, people, rich people who were backing him might own. And um, they, they all had some sort of indeterminate liberal ideology, but um, as for what that exactly meant, um, nobody really knew. Now, in 1919, there are two massive threats to that order. Um, one comes from the fact that the Catholics of Italy, and Italy is obviously a Catholic country, which has an infallible pope, so they'd been told since 1870. Um, the Catholics get around to organising a political party in 1919, and it's called the Partito Popolare, the Popular Party. Um, and it at once becomes a major force in the Italian political system when there are elections at the end of 1919. Um, there's also a socialist party, which had begun in, 18, in the 1890s, 
in every European state before 1914, socialism was growing. And of course, um, when it comes to historians arguing about the origins of the First World War, there have been long-standing suggestions that Imperial Germany was notably aggressive because its rulers were afraid of the threat of the German Social Democratic Party, the SPD. In Italy, um, the socialists had objected to Italy entering into the war. They'd been really in many ways, neither one thing nor the other. Their slogan was neither support nor sabotage, but they certainly hadn't favored the war. And that meant that in 1919, when the country was obviously um, poor, troubled, um, inflation, economic difficulties, um, the, the governments had spent more in fighting the First World War than all Italian governments had spent between 1860 and 1913. So it was a massive, a massive blow in a way against the Italian economy. And lots of um, people had um, joined trade unions. Um, membership probably doubled by 1919, 1920. And people um, speak about, spoke then, and historians still speak about a biennio rosso between 1919 and 1920, that means a red two years in which it looked as though one of these new mass forces, very likely the socialists, would take power in Italy and would impose a system that was very different from the Italian version of a liberal politics. Mussolini had been a socialist, but in 1914, as we've already seen, he decided that Italy should enter the war. This was the stance of anyone really who thought of themselves as an intellectual or a proto-intellectual in Italy. And perhaps for that reason, more, more than anything else, he, he favoured the war. He fought in the war as a soldier. He was wounded, okay, behind the lines, but he was wounded. Um, and um, he therefore could appear as something like an ordinary Italian soldier in 1919. And that was certainly one of the first parts of the fascist movement. In 1919, however, the fascist movement was really, all things considered, a dismal failure. It, it tried to um, put forward radical sounding policies. For example, it opposed the monarchy. So it talked about being Republican. It opposed the Catholic Church. So it talked about the Pope being thrown out of Rome. It talked about massive taxation on war profiteers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in November 1919, when there were elections, Mussolini stood in Milan, um, was lucky to get 4,000 votes, and the triumphant socialists carried a coffin around the city labelled Benito Mussolini, which they threw into the then river that apparently then still flowed in Milan. I don't think you can see one now, but still. Um, and so at the end of 1919, it looked as though the whole thing had, had been a failure, that Mussolini was someone of political ambition already before 1914, obviously, but he would have to find some sort of new some sort of new basis if he really was going to be a duce of any kind at all. Okay, interesting. So, so Mussolini is in this position where he's been defeated and it looks like the socialists have won. So how does, how does he win then? How does he come back from that defeat? Well, in, in 19, remember that it's, it's all pretty quick in, um, the, the date that the fascist regime would ascribe to its rev so-called revolution was the 28th of October, 1922. So in, within three years or so, Mussolini goes from being a nothing and a nobody really at the end of 1919 to being the prime minister of Italy appointed by the king and so on and so forth. What happens there are really um, two, two basic things that occur in 1920 and 1921. Um, and they are that the um, fascist movement begins to latch on to nationalism, um, to perhaps a xenophobic nationalism, perhaps a extreme nationalism. They do this particularly in those parts of Italy where Italy has made some territorial gains in the First World War and got the two cities really of Trieste, Trieste um, and uh, Trento, and further north Bolzano, from Austria-Hungary, the Alto Adige, as it's called in Italian, the Sud Tyrol, as the Germans call. In these territories, um, there was a mixture of um, nationality, mixture of ethnicity defined by language usage. So in 
Trieste, there were plenty of Slovenians, there were some Croats, it was also a city with a long Jewish tradition. And then there were Italians. In the Trento, Trentino, the um, area was really radically split between. You can still, in fact, if you go up the train line, see where Italian looking houses suddenly change into German looking houses somewhere between Trento and Bolzano. And in that part of the world, in other words, Italy had what I think historians have called the Habsburg disease. This is the disease, the problem that I guess the American historian Tim Snyder in his book with the wonderful title of Bloodlands has used as the first basis for the truly appalling history of Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe after the First World War and for the millions and millions and millions of deaths that would occur there, a story that was never replicated at that level in Italy. But anyway, in Trieste, especially initially, and in the Trentino, the fascist movement starts to grow and to grow as a movement which is going to favour um, Italians. It's going to demand that Slovenians change their names, that they don't get jobs. Uh, quite early on in 1920, the Slovenian newspaper and um, working men's office in Trieste is assaulted by fascists. Um, well, Mussolini wasn't there himself, but still he was back in Milan writing in his paper. Um, but he would soon approve of it and he would actually um, perhaps invent, I don't know, certainly was the very early person to use the metaphor about ethnic cleansing, the idea of ethnic cleansing. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. <coughs> Trieste should be cleansed of, um, of Slovenes, cleansed of Slovaks, uh, of Croats, cleansed of people who were not Full, fully fledged Italian. So that was one mm. part of the movement. And then, so you, sorry, yeah. sorry, Richard, just just to chip in there with a mm. question: if if Mussolini was one of the first people to use a phrase ethnic cleansing, where did the idea come to him from? What was the provenance of the idea as he put into practice? Mussolini was a journalist. I think ideas came to him very easily. He just liked writing striking phrases. Really, I don't think that you can track some. Um, direct inter intellectual inheritance for, for Mussolini about almost anything really, and certainly mm. not about, about that use of that phrase suddenly popping up in his, in his speech making. Mm. Um, the, the other side of um, the growth of the, of the Fasci di Combattimento in 1920 were especially in northern rural areas of Italy. So in other words, in the Po Valley, in Tuscany, where fascists had a long tradition later too of being particularly vicious, and in Umbria. Um, that was where fascism started to get even more members than they could get because it was a much bigger area, obviously, a bigger population than in Trieste or in Trento or something. Um, there, the fascist movement becomes one which rather denying moving away from the radicalism of some of its social and political aims in 1919 where it becomes the agents really of local landowners, of respectable town dwellers, because this Italy is of course the country of a hundred cities, a hundred città, where every city has a wonderful Renaissance tradition and the beautiful cathedral and all that sort of stuff and wonderful town square and beautiful food. And these people did not like the idea of socialist unionist uh, peasants becoming socialist unionists, of demanding higher pay, of going on strike, of themselves sometimes being violent in confronting their political and social opponents. And the fascist movement becomes a sort of, in that part of the world, it becomes a movement of reaction, essentially anti-Marxist Mussolini from being a Marxist now um, talks about how terrible Bolshevism is using the, the word from Russia and um, derides Lenin and people like that and says that the fascists will become the political movement that restores order and decency and discipline. And uh, the richer people of, of Italy, particularly the town dwellers against people out in the little villages or whatever outside the town, they think this is a great idea. And so the movement grows and grows and grows. And it also grows and grows and grows because it's unapologetically violent. So the fascists are, most of the members are people who've had experience in the war, returned soldiers or young men who are rather disgusted that the war had ended too early for them to take military service and they become accustomed to 
um, going out to um, um, rooms where uh, perhaps it's a socialist meeting place where, because um, after all, Italy was still a country of great illiteracy where someone would be reading a socialist newspaper to other uh, other unionists who weren't particularly literate to try to explain to them what socialism stood for, etc. And they would um, break in, beat up the people who were there, burn the office down. And, and meanwhile, the police and the army would stand by and say, oh, well, it's only socialists, really. So you are talking then about an essentially anti-Marxist movement and that's the movement which really moves on to march on Rome, the capital city, in October 1922. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Actually, I was reading Mussolini's interview with Oscar Levy in the New York Times from, I think it was November 1924, and mm -hmm. Levy is full of praise for Mussolini and particularly the idea of fascism, noting it as an antidote to Bolshevism. So it does seem like that was that was a real driver there, like you say. So. So let's let's skip ahead a little bit then in terms of Mussolini being, being in power, his fascist regime is in power. Let's go back to that that big grand question from the the top, in terms of what that what that looked like. What did that? How did that change things for for Italians in everyday life? And and what did it mean for regular people, particularly the individual? How did it affect people's lives? Well, I mean, obviously, that's a very grand question because I know that individuals had very um, different reactions. What one finds is that there's, all, again, a process that in October 1922, Mussolini becomes the prime minister of a coalition government. So um, he is, is, is the prime minister. There are, whatever, I forget the number, three or four of his colleagues have ministerial posts. And there are other ministerial people who are old liberals, the... Um, people, the, the two men who'd been head of the army and the navy at the end of the First World War both become ministers of the army and of the navy. Um, there are Catholics who, um, conservative Catholics, who are rather disgruntled by some of the leftist behaviour of the Partito Popolare there in the cabinet. And so it's it's not, a, not clear that really yet that there's a revolution, a political revolution, let alone a social revolution. But... Um, in 1924, there is another crisis when the moderate and wealthy socialist deputy Giacomo Matteotti, who had lots of international contacts, is kidnapped and murdered by a fascist gang, by one of these violent gangs, actually headed by a chap who'd been born, I seem to remember, in Chicago, but perhaps well-trained. Um, um, and... Um, uh, the question then is, well, will the king, will the pope, will the, the, the rich people of Italy tolerate a government where the prime minister may not have deliberately planned this murder, but um, spoke it in the same way, I suppose, that Henry II spoke the murder of Beckett and so on. Will someone rid me of this annoying person who gives anti-fascist speeches? Um, and... Um, for example, the car of the, uh, that the, the kidnappers used was parked inside one of the more important ministries in Rome for the night before um, the kidnapping when Matteotti was grabbed from a street in Rome just beside the Tiber River near his flat and taken away and murdered. Um, that meant a crisis. And for three or four months, it was very unclear whether Mussolini would survive um, on, I said, on one side, there's the question of what's the king going to do about this? On the other side, there's the questions what the fascists are going to do about that. And they get more and more annoyed with Mussolini for not doing anything. By December 1924, they're telling him that if he doesn't do something, well, they'll do something to him. And so on the 3rd of January 1925, Mussolini gives a speech to the parliament, to the Chamber of Deputies proclaiming himself basically dictator and accepting full responsibility for any violence that had occurred at any stage during the fascist movement from 1919 to 1925 and therefore embedding violence, um, fascist violence, so long as it was fascist violence, not socialist violence, at the very base of the regime. So it's from 1925 that Mussolini is dictator of Italy. He actually seems almost to have had a sort of nervous breakdown as a result of these matters and was ill for a couple of months afterwards. But um, he recovered and resumed. And um, by uh, the anniversary of the um, 
um, March on Rome that year, he also uh, announces that Italy will now be a totalitarian state that word, which is almost as important and used almost as loosely as fascism, originates again in Italy. And um, it's going to be a state where all is for the state. Nothing is uh, outside the state. No one is against the state. So a state which is going to be um, all controlling of, um, of the population and of their, um, their profound behaviour and their everyday behaviour, I suppose. Historians um, rather disagree uh, uh, over the character of Italian totalitarianism, and I'm on one side, very much on one side, so probably what I say shouldn't be trusted. There are people who take it very seriously and do believe that Mussolini had a sort of mind control over the Italian population, perhaps an increasing one after 1925 through to the Second World War, and um, therefore Italians lost the ability to think um, I'm uh, very unconvinced. Um, I can talk about all sorts of reasons why, but I don't know whether you want me to do that. It's interesting. We might come on to this in a moment, Richard, when we talk about Mussolini's values and, and where he's coming from. So, mm -hmm. so maybe perhaps all that thought, that, but that is, that is interesting, the impact that he had on the people that, that he was governing and, and yes. particularly how, how they responded to him. It seems as though... What I infer, and you might not have meant this, so I'll say what I infer, and you can correct me if I've got it completely wrong, but from what you were saying about the use of violence, the ethnic cleansing, these ideas very much sound like demagoguery 101. So blame blame the minorities, blame the other people and who, who are seen as foreign or other and will take care of them, and I'm going to kind of lead the way in doing that. That does sound, that does sound like it's something that, that tends to appeal to people when times are hard so Mussolini clearly tapped into that as, as I infer it from from my own understanding um it is interesting looking at, at this question of Mussolini now of course because we have all like you said you know the term totalitarianism is used loosely as is fascism as I mentioned previously what about Mussolini's contemporaries though who were his contemporary authoritarian chiefs at the time that he came to power well, I, he is, I guess, the first modern European dictator. Um, there obviously had been a long tradition of dictators in Latin America in the 19th century, um, but Mussolini is the first person really to have those sorts of powers and, and the, after all has them for a generation. In Italy, anyone who comes after Mussolini is therefore to some extent influenced by Mussolini or anyway knows about the existence of, of Mussolini. Um, it's a very complicated story because um, fascism, with a, there's always this problem about when you use the word fascism, whether you mean fascism with a capital F, which means the Italian fascist system, or whether you use fascism with a small f, where you mean something more general something international that could occur anywhere, any, in, in any place. In many ways, for the first decade of his regime, Mussolini talks as though, mostly talks as though, he's a journalist and he's perfectly capable of saying one thing on Friday and another thing on Saturday. But he mostly talks of fascism as being, quote, not for export, not for export, just Italian. Another sign of the way in which Italy naturally led the world as it had done under Julius Caesar and in the Renaissance and all that sort of stuff, blah, blah, blah. So you, you can imagine a nationalist curriculum wanting to, to say that. Um, but he's also not above suggesting that um, other um, people uh, can learn from fascism and um, that um, it, it, it is indeed um, so such a very successful system that that would only be sensible. And what also is occurring in Europe in the 1920s is that there are a whole lot of authoritarian chiefs popping up. Um, most of them, um, not all of them, but quite a few of them because of the troubles of the bloodlands of those ex parts of the Habsburg Empire and the Romanov Empire um, that had had a difficult First World War and an even more difficult time between 1919 and 1922-23, or whatever date you want to give it. Um, after all, again, the number of people who die in Italy in the rise of fascism is generally reckoned to be about 3,000, about 
two thirds of them being anti-fascist socialists and some Catholics and about a third of them being fascists. But those numbers per head of population, for example, are no more than the number who die in Ireland in the Irish Civil War and the Black and Tans and all that story, let alone the number of people who die in the, in the uh, confused and difficult regimes that are uh, have, uh, taking over the new states of uh, Eastern and Central Europe. Although it's also true that the person who becomes dictator only shortly after Mussolini and who actually the king of um, his country calls my Mussolini is in fact um, uh, General Miguel Primo de Rivera in Spain, Alfonso XIII calls him my Mussolini. Um, so in other words, the word Mussolini has come to mean some authoritarian figure, I suppose. And there's lots of authoritarian figures around. The one who is really completely off the script is, of course, little Adolf Hitler in, in Germany, who, OK, attempts his beer hall putsch in um, Munich in November 1923 um, and says that he's trying to be like Mussolini and um, um, has, has a, is it a bust or is it a picture of Mussolini? I think it's a bust of Mussolini in his office in Munich for the years that follow. But the Italians are really not very interested in, in this movement. They show few signs of thinking it's serious and after all, it isn't serious. They're right in doing that. They've got to pursue their, their foreign policies in some sort of realistic fashion. So um, in the 1930s, matters will get even more complicated, I think. Um, 1932, so I, I will just roll on as so a 1932 is the 10th anniversary of the regime taking office, so the 10th anniversary of the March on Rome. And there are tremendous celebrations for this, uh, as you might expect in a dictatorship, I suppose. Tremendous emphasis on Mussolini as this wonderful charismatic duce who's, who's solved all Italy's problems and the Italian economy hadn't done too badly in the... 1920s and although it also suffered from the depression, um, perhaps it, it, it hadn't, um, wasn't in, in a totally ruined condition. There's a big exhibition set up in one of the main streets of Via Nazionale running down from near the station towards um, Mussolini's office, which looks out on the Vittorio Emanuele monument in the Piazza Venezia. And um, much, much money is spent on celebrating Italian fascism and um, a philosopher called Giovanni Gentile, now allegedly with Mussolini's assistance, but one imagines that it, most of the writing would have been done by Gentile, writes a 35 page article on what fascism actually is. So that happens 10 years after fascism has been in office. And one of the things that's particularly important about it, I suppose, is that it, it, it's not anti Semitic, it's not any more racist than every European is in. 1932 is the idea of a corporate state, the idea that fascism has solved the class struggle. So in that sense, it has beaten the Marxists at their own game. It has solved the class struggle by establishing organizations which have um, owners of property, owners of businesses, owners of factories, and their workers meeting, discussing pay and conditions and how to get the better, uh, a bit of productivity and those sorts of matters. So in a way, that corporate idea is one of the characters. I don't think it's particularly a Mussolini idea. He takes it up, but um, he's, I mean, there's, a, there's a, um, a sort of starstruck younger fascist called Giuseppe Bottai, respectable background in Rome, who um, probably becomes the most important of Mussolini's ministers in terms of favoring the idea of a corporate state. All of that is probably incredibly ironical for us now, because I suppose the state, it seems to me that most resembles a corporate state in some of the fascist, the Italian fascist theoretics is, is Germany, is the Germany of our own times, where by great contrast to Britain, for example, workers and, and business do cheerfully work together. And um, where there's also welfare, because that was the other claim that the regime was making with a corporate state was that the poor people in society would indeed receive welfare. Um, I can talk to you about what welfare was really like if you want me to, but I don't know if you do. We, we, we might struggle to cover that, Richard. There's, there's, <laughs> there's, an, awful, there's an awful lot to get through today in, in this. Indeed. Uh, like you say, I've, I've asked you these gargantuan questions. And as I look through my list of questions, all of them are pretty 
gargantuan in their own right. So I, I want to give you a chance to, to to answer them succinctly, but also get through everything that we can in, in the, the parameters of the time. I am interested in picking up what you mentioned about Adolf Hitler there, Richard, because I think it's quite interesting that you note Mussolini as the, the, the first of the two fascist dictators. And in terms of reputation, in terms of impact on the history of the world and everything else, Hitler's the one who outshines Mussolini. In, well, I don't know if that's the right way of putting it, but he's the one who eclipses Mussolini in terms of his impact and influence. But but how over time did Hitler and Mussolini, or Mussolini and Hitler, influence each other? I'm quite interested in that question, in terms of, in terms of politics, ideas, and also governance as well. Well, I, again, I think um, at a superficial level, which is the way in which it's most often treated, um, they, 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 they become partners. They're the partners in the axis, in the first axis of evil. Remember George Bush would use the term again. Um, uh, but I think in, in reality, there's probably lots of differences. I, the Nazi movement was not very interested in the, the idea of a corporate state it really didn't use the word totalitarian about itself either, actually. And the ascription of totalitarianism to it, to it in many ways comes, I mean, okay, there are some people who start talking that way in the 1930s, but lots of it has to do with Cold War academic life when um, the theoreticians decide that um, Germany and the Soviet Union, Stalin and the Soviet Union are very similar. They're both the enemies of liberal democracy and capitalism and therefore they must have both been totalitarian. Italy is almost always left out of these um, discussions because its totalitarianism is so relatively mild, I suppose, compared with um, those of uh, Germany and indeed of the Soviet Union. Um, so there's lots of differences. Italy also is not, not anti-Semitic. I mean, the, the majority of um, it, it, the tradition of Italian Jews who weren't as numerous as they were in Germany, perhaps 50,000 or so of them had been to be patriotic, to be Italian nationalists. The, their enemy of had been the Catholic Church or anyway, the Catholic Church had treated them like an enemy. And so when liberal Italy as an anti-clerical regime came into existence in the 19th century, it was natural enough for Italy's Jews to support the new Italian nation. They fought in its armies in the First World War. There were Jewish generals um, there were, um, Mussolini had a Jewish minister of finance in the 1930s. And so the, the, the German obsession with the Nazi obsession with the Jewish peril was just not there in Italian discourse in any serious fashion, I think, um, until, uh, until the middle later 1930s when perhaps things were changing quite a bit because of what was changing in Europe. Um, so there's, some similarities, but I mean, if you if you read the Italian literature about strong men in over the sort of period from 1932, 1933, 1934, 1935, you find that there is some effort to parallel Mussolini and Hitler, always with Mussolini, of course, as being the, the key person, the, the teacher, not the learner. But there are also parallels um, with, uh, with uh, various, I mean, with Dolfish, who's murdered by the Nazis in Austria in 1934, um, with um, authoritarian figures in Greece, in, in the Baltic countries. Um, there are parallels alleged with uh, Franklin Roosevelt in the United States, and Mussolini does actually, in one of his quickie journalistic articles in 1933, I think, um, have a little passage saying that if only I could be as powerful as Roosevelt is, if only I had the same access to power that Roosevelt has. And anyway, Roosevelt, because of his own interest in the state intervening in capitalism, is showing signs of becoming like me, becoming some sort of fascist. And there are also slightly weird efforts to, um, by young radical um, fascist intellectuals who, who want to make a, make a name for themselves, who um, decide that actually Stalin is becoming a fascist too. Um, maybe they're sort of getting around to thinking the same way that American political scientists think in the 1950s. But the idea that um, Stalin is, is defending the Russian nation and is defending a state is something that appeals to these people and actually Italian communists. So anti-fascist people who are in jails in, in Italy um, have, a, have a period of favouring a policy of what's called Fratelli in Camice Nere, 
brothers in black shirts, and that's them saying that, oh, well, Mussolini's, you know, a bit yuck and uh, taking Ethiopia is a bit naughty and so on and so forth. But you're, you're favouring a revolution. That's what we favour, a revolution. So you're our brothers, even though you're wearing black shirts and we're wearing red ones. So it's a pretty complicated story. Yeah, and it's yeah. not just a simple story of everyone being a bird fascist or something. Or <laughs> and being no, like exactly. Hitler. I, I think yeah. Hitler is. I think Hitler is such an unusual dictator. That's why I think it's worthwhile saying to you that when it comes to thinking about dictators in the modern world, and heaven knows there've been plenty of them and still are, Mussolini is so much better a, a model to explore than is Hitler. Hitler was so different. He was so obsessed. He so was sure that he knew scientifically with his pseudoscience of racism as, as to mm. what was to be done. He was so total in yeah. wanting to murder every Jew in the entire world. Mussolini is just not like that. He's a journalist. He can say anything he likes from one week to the next and yeah. change his mind from one week to the next. Okay. Inter that's interesting. That, that, that's very interesting that you, that you speak. And, of course, it's nothing new to say that, that, that Hitler was an ideologue. We, we, we all get that, we all know that, but interesting that you distinguish between him and Mussolini in that way to say that, that Mussolini, again, as I infer from what you're saying is that Mussolini is much more practical, he's much more pragmatic than Hitler and he's drawing on ideas from all over the place because he's a journalist and he's getting information from a lot of places, he's talking to a lot of people, et cetera. There's, there is something I have to, to raise with you on that matter of, of Mussolini. Let, let's move now to the man himself and what he does believe because one of the things that that seems to be enduring in, in my reading of Mussolini whether it's an interview that I've read of his or whether it's various things references in, in your biography of Mussolini as well is of course Friedrich Nietzsche as well and, and Nietzsche does seem to me to endure as a potential influence now as you also write in your biography of Mussolini from 2002 he did, he loved to exhibit various different thinkers and philosophers, and he was quite grandiloquent about that and flaunting that about, showing everybody how well read he is, how cultured he is, etc. And, and no doubt that gives him some sort of credibility and adds credence to his status as the, the, the great man or whatever it is that he was going for. I, I go back to that, that interview with Oscar Levy in November 1924. And the headline, and of course, this is this is not Mussolini's headline, but but Levy's headline is that that Nietzsche was Mussolini's spiritual master. And in the article or in the interview, Mussolini says he speaks about how he's re he read Nietzsche as a young man and how Nietzsche cured him of his socialism. And there's, there's one quite quite nifty quote. You're shaking your head already. There's one quite nifty quote uh, before, before I get your take on this which says, I was deeply, and this is Mussolini speaking, I was also deeply impressed by Nietzsche's wonderful precept, live dangerously. I have lived up to that, I think. So what do you make of that? What do you make of, of Nietzsche's actual substantive influence on Mussolini and Mussolini's approach? Does he have this will to power, if we want to use a phrase from Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra? Um, I think he does have a have some sort of personal will to power, um, but I don't think it comes from Nietzsche. Um, I don't think it comes from, any, from Nietzsche at all. I don't think it comes from his reading. I think it comes from his personality and also for the opportunities for the various, for the Harold Macmillan's events, dear boy events that give him some opportunities at certain moments that he might not have expected. Um, there's just no question that Mussolini is the sort of journalist who, and I'm, I couldn't possibly think of parallels with our contemporary, still I believe, prime minister of this country, but um, he, um, he he loves to be able to make it look as though he's been reading someone really significant. And um, I, the, the best example that I like about that, I think, is a meeting that he has with Ezra Pound who, of course, is a pro-fascist poet and does war propaganda for Italy in the Second World War and so on. But um, he, he, Pound goes in to see Mussolini in, the, in his office in the um, Palazzo Venezia. He moves in there in 1929. Um, and um, Mussolini has Ezra Pound's books on his desk. And when Pound's, you know, they 
they make a few desultory remarks to each other. And then Mussolini points out how wonderful it has been to read all the cantos and how he knows every exact word and how he's perfectly capable of it, etc. And all of that is complete bullshit. All of that is just Mussolini pretending and getting through an interview. I think there is an interesting thing to point out because there's really been new material that's only become available from the archives in the last few years. And that is that we now have access to Mussolini's appointment books. And of course, Mussolini's often written off as a joke. And that I think is, is a very poor idea because he actually works pretty hard. He tends to show up at the office at eight or nine o'clock in the morning and leaves at eight o'clock at night. He often works a six day week. Um, and we have these lists of what's going on there. Um, he does have a, a break for lunch. He has a break for siesta. And it's also clear from other sort of evidence that he has a break for sex on some occasion or other. Um, I wrote a book about Mussolini's last lover, Claretta Petacci, um, and Mussolini found time to ring her 12 times a day um, in the sort of times of great crisis in the late 1930s or during the war or something or other. And I don't know how many executives find enough time to ring their lovers and that often, but um, maybe someone should write a book about that, who knows. Um, but when you look at these meetings, what's interesting about them is that the mornings are really always pretty consistent in that Mussolini will see people to talk to them about foreign affairs. He'll see people to talk to them about the state of the economy. And most important, he'll see the head of the secret police. The head of the secret police in Italy, who no one's ever heard of, is a man called Arturo Bocchini, at least until he died in 1914, having eaten too much and been too sexually active. Um, but Bocchini was a career bureaucrat. So he's not a Himmler. He doesn't believe in anything except in Bocchini. Um, and he behaves like that. So he's perfectly happy in um, putting Marxists in jail. Um, in rather nasty circumstances, he's perfectly happy um, pointing out to Mussolini how corrupt um, the, his fascist ministers are or his various officials are or anything like that. Um, so Mussolini talks to him. In the afternoon, there's an array of meetings, people like Ezra Pound, members of this, that or the other society, some people who are foreigners, some people who are Italians, and the only other thing that's rather noticeable is that at 7 or 7.30, the last meeting at night, he must have had a cunning secretary who's with a woman. But apart from that, it's, it's, it's a huge array. Now, what Mussolini has to be like in these meetings is that he has to seem an expert. It's, a, it's, a, it's as though he's running one of those sort of radio programs that shock jocks run nowadays, where you talk for 10 minutes to someone and then someone else and then someone else and then someone else. And it's on one topic or another topic or another topic or yet another topic still. And what people say is two, two things about what it was like. One is that, um, that one of the fascist boasts was that he made the Mussolini made the trains run on time, but meetings don't run on time. And so outside Mussolini's office in the Palazzo Venezia, there's a, there's a big room and that's where people have assembled ministers, minor ministers, officials, et cetera, et cetera. And they spend their time bickering and, and engaging in little inter Nissan struggles in their own interests out there. What also seems to be true is that Mussolini is likely to agree with you if you come and see him. And so he's likely to say, yes, those cantos are just superb. It's what a wonderful piece of work. But if the next person who comes in is someone who's said Ezra Pound is a complete idiot, Mussolini will say, ah, oh, yes, that's completely right. That's terrific. Just I agree with that. I do agree. A natural enough way of behaving if you're going to have this sort of power. Um, it's a very curious form of power. And most people say that one of the complications about Italian activities in the 1930s is that actually it's not very clear what, 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 is, what is going to be done. There's certainly the efforts to, of Mussolini to be a, a war leader seem to break on, on these sorts of issues that yeah. no one is really on top of matters. Mm. There are no checks and balances. And so it's a charismatic system. Yeah. Um, based around this all-knowing dictator, but the all-knowing dictator is not all-knowing. And I rather suspect, so I don't entirely detest Mussolini, that he knew this. He does on 
um, one stage remarked to a young acolyte about how there are two Mussolinis and they're always engaged in battle and he's never sure who's going to win, but he really hopes one of them wins one of these days. Right. Okay. Interesting. So a sense of double consciousness. Power, there. Is, power is difficult. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. So very much like you say about the, the charismatic side of things, going back to that that demagogic nature of, of leadership and telling people essentially what, what they want to hear, because that's what it is on mass, isn't it? Demagoguery is appealing to the passions and prejudices of the masses. So I've, I've got to ask you, you mentioned Claretta, you mentioned uh, Clara Patacci, who was Mussolini's last lover. I've, I've got to ask you about this because I did I did pick up your book, Claretta. I haven't by any means had a chance to finish reading it yet. But there was something in there. You, you quoted a contemporary journalist historian, Roberto Olla, who said that sex was at the centre of the myth of Mussolini. All the rest turned upon this like a wheel around a hub. Now, to what extent would you say that applies in understanding Mussolini, the man, and what, what drives him and his values? I think it's terribly hard to answer these questions as to what you know, 30 or whatever they were, 30 million or so, coming up to 40 million Italians thought about their dictator. I think one of the, see a totalitarian state, perhaps it's true in North Korea, who knows, that everyone wakes up in the morning and thinks Kim, and then they don't think anything else during the day except for Kim. But it's absolutely evident that Italians out there, they think of their family, and the fascist regime never really develops a different or specific policy about families. Nazi Germany does a lot more, but Italy, no. And Mussolini, of course, has his own family of a wife and five difficult kids, and as well as his eight or nine illegitimate kids, and maybe there are more than that, but ones that we've got officially down. Um, the family is still there. The priest is still there. Italy's still a Catholic country. Um, there are a couple of occasions when Pope Pius XI says, yes, this totalitarian is very good. That's our system here in the church. Because he doesn't know what we now think totalitarianism. But it's, it, it, it's, it's an interesting parallel. Class is still there. Fascism, if it's meant to be anti-Marxist and have everyone happy in a corporate state, should have abolished class. But Italians know whether they're peasants or not. They know if you're if you live in some Chita in southern Italy say that the last thing you want is for your daughter to marry a peasant. They come from outside. They're uncivilised. They're barbarous. That doesn't really change either. Um, so, so class remains. So does region. I just said the Italian south. Everyone in Italy knows that southern Italians are different from northern Italians. And Mussolini comes from the Romagna and he knows that Romagna is best and the other parts of Italy are not really as good as, and that Naples is the worst, really, all things considered. And so there are all those complications. And I guess the, 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 the point that I'm trying to make in all of this is that the French historian Fernand Braudel, in a German prisoner of war camp in the Second World War, developed the ideas that turned out to be the basis of a so-called anal historiography. And he had a tripartite division of time he said there was histoire venimentielle, immediate political history. And so the, what, was, what happened to Mattiotti and when the corporate state might or might not have started functioning and all that sort of stuff. There's histoire of the moyenne durée of middling time and there's long durée history, history of, 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 of the centuries. And I think you can read the functioning of the Italian dictatorship very well like that because there's quite a bit of fascism and I don't want to make it just sound completely superficial. It is violent. And I mean, the regime was responsible for the premature deaths of about a million people. We haven't really talked about that. 500,000 or so, I suppose, in the Second World War, 500,000 or so, the peoples of its empire in Libya and Ethiopia particularly. And, um, but there were plenty of things that it didn't do where it was a sham, where it was a failure, where it wasn't... A, where it was a political revolution, but not a social revolution, I guess, where things didn't change. Lots of things about Italy after 1945 evidently had not changed. And after all, we are facing the fact that in a couple of weeks' time, Italy is going to have elections. And if the present opinion polls are right, then the largest political party in the Italian chamber is going to become the so-called Fratelli d'Italia, which is a neo-fascist political party. And so um, 
I don't think that it's going to want to exterminate the Jews in the world. I don't think it's going to want to launch world war, but it is going to continue to have quite a positive view of Mussolini. Mm, very interesting. There, were, there was a time, of course, when I, I read in one another another newspaper article that, that Mussolini always envis envisioned that fascism would outlive him, that, that he as Mussolini wouldn't live forever, but fascism would. So going back to Mussolini, the, the man, it wasn't a happy ending for him and it wasn't a happy ending for Claretta either. So where did it all go wrong for him then? Well, I don't know that it's ever gone completely right in that um, the party members were bickering and um, Italy's... I, I guess the high point of the regime is probably in 1936, in May 1936, when Italian troops enter in the Sababa and Italy has a major imperial seeming victory. In fact, it's only seeming because actually they haven't taken over the whole country and a sort of Ethiopian resistance of some description continues thereafter. This has been done at tremendous, with tremendous barbarity, with huge expense, massive armies sent to, uh, to fight the Ethiopians. But given Italy's record of military defeats and so on, it made a change. And um, Muslim himself never went to Ethiopia, but um, I think the, the historian uh, De Felice, Renzo De Felice, great Italian, Biographer Mussolini called it um, Mussolini's masterpiece. <clears throat> and perhaps it was in the sense of making Italy nearer to being a genuine great power than it had been before. And given that Italy was the least of the great powers, and really that I think was one of its problems um, in the Moyendure, really, um, that uh, this, this victory was. But after that, and perhaps already. Uh, that, what what, what um, invading Ethiopia does, because Ethiopia had been a member of the League of Nations, however curious that was, opinion in the Anglo-Saxon world, opinion in Britain, opinion in France, um, was suddenly decided really in a way they hadn't before 1935 that Mussolini was a bad guy, that Mussolini was the bad dictator. Um, Hitler, you weren't too sure about yet, but Mussolini was definitely a bad guy and should be opposed. And so Italian foreign policy is being pushed nearer and nearer down a road, which is going to lead to alliance with Germany and to the merging of Italian fascism with a capital F and German Nazism, perhaps it was fascism with a small F, I'm not sure, um, in, in the Second World War and on to terrible military defeat. Because of course, what happens um, when Italy enters the Second World War in June 1940 is that in October, they try to attack Greece um, by themselves without really telling the Germans, um, behaving as a sort of independent as they thought they were um, ally. And basically the Greeks beat them, um, given that Greece is a very small power by comparison with Italy. Um, there are all sorts of tremendous military blunders involved in this attack. And from there, eventually the Nazis come and rescue the Italians after six months or so. But um, after that, Italy becomes what I guess I call in my biography of Mussolini, I think Germany's ignoble second as its partner in the Second World War. And there's very little room for compromise. I mean, one of the areas that's interesting in this regard is actually the attack on the Soviet Union. I suppose I think the fanatic Hitler always wanted to attack the Soviet Union, always wanted to exterminate Judeo-Bolshevism, as he called it, and was always determined on that war. The Italians, um, di diplomatic, they, they'd been anti-Marxist. The regime was fundamentally anti-Marxist, so it said. Between 1922 and 1940, its diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union were perfectly normal. Um, it sold war materials, for example, to the Soviet Union. It didn't treat the Soviet Union as an ideological enemy. Okay, so Italy decides in the in 1941, the summer of 1941, it's got to go with the Germans and the bloody Germans have got to accept that the Italians are there. Otherwise people will start thinking the Italians aren't the real leaders. So the Italians go, they're not very good at fighting in Russia. They're violent, perhaps not quite in the same manner as the Germans, but certainly it's a bloody war. It, it's, and, and so it, 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 what's the sensible thing to do? Well, the sensible thing to do, of course, is to find a compromise peace someone could whisper about to Mr. Putin about this at the moment. Um, but when Mussolini whispers to Hitler, 
what about a compromised peace? Because actually the Anglo-Americans are attacking us and causing a lot of trouble in Libya and so on. Um, Hitler says, I'm not doing that. And so you have a conflict between an ideological leader waging an ideological war in, to the bitter end in the Soviet Union and a realistic, so we thought, dictator who thinks, oh, well, okay, look, Stalin will forgive us a few million dead. We can always find a compromise peace and, you know, who knows what that means with that little bit of the Crimea or, or whatever. Um, and that's what's, that's what's going on. Mussolini's war aims, I think, in the Second World War are still essentially those of a 19th century imperialist, European imperialist, a British prime minister or a French prime minister. Mm -hmm. um, he, he wants a little bit of Uganda maybe and then perhaps Kenya and all sorts of places that probably most of this population have never heard of. What he doesn't want, and here's another massive difference from Nazi Germany, is that he doesn't want to annex the United States and Argentina. Millions and millions of Italians lived there. In 1913, 873,000 Italians emigrated in one year. But that, that sort of policy, which maybe would have been popular with Italians, let's have our cousins back from New York, why not? And let's colour New York green, white and red and stick up Fasco's. But it's not, it's not like that. Whereas the German foreign policy is always about bringing Germans home to the Reich and okay, exterminating the millions and millions of people who happen to be in the way. It's very yeah. different, I think. Yeah, I love that. I love that distinction. I love how you're bringing these distinctions to bear, Richard. I think it's really important that we that we are careful in how we look at this, because just in this conversation today, there's so much complexity going on in Italy itself, let alone before we even get on to any comparisons. I, I, I do know the, the almost irony in, in what you're saying about Mussolini's downfall in the sense that he's got involved in all these wars that he doesn't really seem to be able to handle. Yes, okay, he succeeds in Libya, well, the Italian but... The economy hasn't really been modernised. Italy is mm. not a great power, any mm. more of a great power in 1940 than it was in 1915, probably less. Mm, mm, mm. And, and that kind of, that sort of egotism, if you like, maybe if, if we can use that phrase again, that will to power is what ultimately leads to, to his undoing, perhaps. Well, it is, except every Italian politician in a way since the country came into existence had tried to make Italy a great power. Italy enters every war that Italy gets into from 1860 to 1945 was entered aggressively. So the fascists, the fascists entered the war, you know, the French haven't attacked them in June 1940, they attacked France. Yeah. Yes, but in 1915 Italy attacked Austria, Austria hadn't attacked them in in, in the 1860s, the wars were like that too. Um, yeah. in, in the colonial wars were always like that. The one in Libya, the yeah. attempt to yeah. conquer Ethiopia in 1896 and so on and so forth. Mm. So, one of the problems, I think, of being the least of the great powers, it's a very difficult role to have. Yeah, yeah, it's, the especially, powers, yeah. It's, it's the comparison, Bismarck, isn't it? Bismarck said Italians have a large appetite and very poor teeth. Right. <laughs> That, that, that's a very uh, devastating combination in, the, in this instance. Okay, Richard, just, just in terms of wrapping things up then, yes. you've already mentioned the, the March on Rome uh, and it being the centenary year of the March on Rome. It's the 28th of October. I've got to ask you how, again, you can't speak for the whole of Italy, of course, accepting that, but how, what, what's your sense of how Italians are going to perceive that? Are people going to be celebrating that? Are they going to be not, not going to be bothered about that? Are they going to be lamenting that? What do, you, what do you think the, the kind of broad perception of that centenary is going to be in the country? Well, I, th I mean, I think it's an interesting question, and I should say that historians are very, very bad at predicting the future. Otherwise, they'd make a lot of money on horses that are, would be certain to win the next race. Um, in Italy, there's the extra complication of these elections due, due in September to the end of September. And it seems really quite likely that little Italy will have a right good leaning government of some description um, at the time of the anniversary, um, where um, presumably Giorgia Milani and her Fratelli d'Italia party will be part of the story and then there'll be the Lega and poor old Berlusconi will still be around somewhere despite being sort of, he should be long dead really, but still he's still alive. Um, Italy is a country where since the Second World War, there's been always a considerable tradition of anti-fascism, 
And I've always thought of myself and still think of myself as an anti-fascist historian. I don't like the dictatorship and what it did. I do think a million premature deaths is rather a lot. Um, and there are plenty of people in Italy still like that. They're a bit bewildered politically, I think, um, and have been probably since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Because Italy used to be also the country with the largest and most sophisticated communist party in Western Europe that at its peak um, got 35 and or so percent of the vote, um, or a third, more than a third of the vote. And anti-fascists could somehow keep themselves going by either supporting or favoring or being sympathetic to the communist party and some of its possible allies in the complex Italian political system. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, that all went away, the communist party collapsed and the parties that have tried to establish themselves since, generally calling themselves democratic, that's generally the most important adjective in the various versions they've been, they've never really been completely successful. So the left, if that's what it is in Italy, is divided, um, confused, and really doesn't seem to have much in the way of political solutions. The right has been making gains um, in recent decades, I suppose, and often by um, making dramatic statements about Mussolini. So Berlusconi, for example, in the early 2000s said, quote, Mussolini never killed anybody. Um, and I suppose perhaps he didn't, I'm not sure what he was doing in the First World War, but, um, um, and, um, you know, suggested that um, the anti-Semitic stuff had only been a minor um, blink in the, in the Italian system and shouldn't be taken too seriously. And so it, it's always been possible in a way for Italians to have a positive image of the Mussolini dictatorship, because although it may have killed a million people, um, and all the least been responsible for their deaths. Half of them were soldiers in the Second World War, roughly speaking, and maybe that can be, war can be blamed on Germany or it can be blamed on Churchill or it can be blamed on who knows whom. It doesn't really have to be blamed on Italy, I suppose. And the other half are people in the Italian empire. So Arabs and Berbers in Libya and the various multiple peoples of the Ethiopian empire and Italy lost its empire boom, with, a, with a click in 1945 and really has stopped worrying about it ever since actually and so whereas Britain and France and Belgium and Portugal and all these other places had complicated ways of getting rid of their empires after 1945 and often went on killing people after 1945 Italy didn't have that problem and so it was at once rescued and Italian historians do tend to be European in their concentrations fixated on Europe. So in that sense, Mussolini, so what did he do wrong is, 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 a, is a question you often get. And um, the, the, the fascist regime um, brought back capital punishment, which had been abolished in Italy in the 1870s, I think. Um, but the number of people that the regime actually executed until the Second World War and even after was, was, was sort of in the tens, in, the, in one this year, two, the next three, the one after that. And if you look at the number of people who are being executed in the United States, say, um, in those years, um, you would find that, the, that um, and, and of course they're, they're criminals, but on the other hand, they're in, 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 in um, curious majority poor blacks, um, rather than rather than whites, so maybe the, there is a political side to these executions. To the, the, the Americans are are executing vastly more. There are vastly more murders in the United States in the nineteen thirties than there are in Italy. And so again, people can say, "Well, it was quite safe then." You know, what's all this fuss about uh, uh, about uh, about Auschwitz? That wasn't our responsibility. And, and that, I think, is how a lot of people will react to the idea of Giorgio Milani. I mean, the, the, the one last point about Giorgio Milani and Fratelli d'Italia, which I've made to a few Italians, and they've always looked at me in great disapproval, because the name of the political party now it used to be called the, the Movimento Sociale Italiano, or MSI, and it was always said that everyone really knew that. What that actually meant was Mussolini sempre immortale, Mussolini will live forever. Um, but the new one is called Fratelli d'Italia, 
that name is the, is the starting point of the Italian national anthem. But of course, in the world of 2022, it is direly sexist. Brothers of Italy. Yeah. Um, and even though the leader is a female, um, surely someone should uh, change it. But what can you change it to? Steve, it was Popolo d'Italia. Whoops, that was the name mm. of Mussolini's newspaper. Mm. In Australia, where I lived for a long time, there was a fascist newspaper for the migrants, which called itself Gente d'Italia, which is another word meaning Popolo. But I don't think yeah. you could have that in the national anthem. So maybe they just need a new national anthem. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. Very, very interesting conversation, Richard. Thank you so much for your time. Just before, okay. just before we sign off, I, you've already said that you've written thirty odd books or so on Italy and Mussolini. I, I don't imagine that you've hung up the proverbial pen just yet. So, may I ask what you're working on at the moment? Yeah, well, I've got one that um, is I've just read the copy edit of um, with Cambridge University Press. That is, if I'm getting the title right. It's called Politics, Murder and Love in an Italian Family. Um, and it's about uh, an Itali uh, two Italians, father and son. Father's called Giovanni, Giovanni Amendola, um, who was basically murdered by the fascists. He was a liberal Democrat, anti-fascist, and was appallingly beaten up in Tuscany, where all the worst fascists were, in 1925 and died as a result, really, in 1926. And his son, Giorgio, who was a teenager, then and watched all these events and then decided all his father's liberal democratic anti-fascist friends were too pitifully weak to be thought about and so he became a communist and he sort of almost became leader of the Italian Communist Party but because the Italian Communist Party was run like a monarchy when the king Togliatti died in on a holiday in the Soviet Union in 1964 the Dauphin had to succeed him and uh, the Dauphin was not Giorgio Mendela, but an older man called Luigi Longo. So Giorgio missed his chance. But it's, it's a very sweet story. There's, there's also sex involved again, as with Cloretta, because um, Giovanni Amenda has a very complicated marriage and a late relationship with a Franco Bulgarian journalist, which I find quite interesting, but which Italian historians have entirely omitted from any discussion of him. Giorgio falls desperately in love with a little Paris girl coming out of a cinema with her mum in can't be 1932 and um, the two get married when Giorgio is on a fascist prison island and it's got all sorts of wonderful stories they live with each other until Giorgio dies of a heart attack in 1980 Germain his wife is with him that night and she dies the next morning of a heart attack too and everyone says well they were never apart so it's an interesting double story of personal life and political life for the two the father and son. Right, sounds fascinating, Rich. And one thing, one okay. thing that strikes me about about really good about really good history is that it, it is a story. Like you say, it is a story. It's something that you can sit down and you can read and you can be engaged in and immersed in. And and the the level of detail that goes into your writing is is really striking. And I've certainly found that from what I've read of of it thus far. So I just want to say in closing, Richard, thank you again for your time on the Real Clear Values podcast. Okay, that's a pleasure, Tom.